Okay. This evening's scripture can be found in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. And the King James Version reads, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The Amplified Version reads this way, Arise from your spiritual depression to a new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory and the brilliance of the Lord, for your light has come, and the glory and the brilliance of the Lord has risen upon you. And I'm titling this message, A Call to Action. A Call to Action. So when we read and when we study scripture, we find that there are several significant times when God is calling for, God is making a call to action. Times when he is ready to do something with his people. These are times when he has gotten sick and tired of their idolatry, their misbehavior, their disobedience, or even times when he has gotten tired of his people being oppressed. So when wickedness was covering the face of the earth, he called Noah to make an escape boat so that he and his family could save the whole human race. He called Abram from out of his father's house and from among his kindred to go to a land that he would show him because he wanted to establish a whole new race of people. After the children of Israel has been in Egypt for 400 years, he called Moses as his emancipator to lead his people out of bondage. And throughout the period of the judges, God called one individual after another to sound the alarm, to act as his voice, calling a wayward people to fight against evil and against darkness. He called them to get up from their slumber, from their places of comfort, but most of all, he called them to get up out of their places of darkness. So as we approach this morning's text, we find that after much rebellion, after much backsliding, and after much compromise, God is again sounding the alarm. He's calling his chosen people back to him not just an individual this time, but he's calling a whole nation of people back to him. Why? Because they had left the path that he had designed for them. He, he, they had left the work that he intended them to do. They were guilty of social injustices. They were guilty of unjust condemnation of people to death. They were guilty of calling false witnesses to produce the verdicts that they wanted and they were guilty of deep social and moral apathy. You see, their situation paralleled ours. Listen to how God describes them. In chapter one, God says that he had nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me, he says. He characterized them as a sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. He called them children that were corrupt, that had have, that have forsaken the Lord and had provoked him to anger. He described their leaders as rebellious and companions of thieves, lovers of gifts and rewards. That is, they, they sought after money and prosperity. And of the women, he says that they are haughty and they are proud, and that they walk with stretched forth necks, heads held high and wanton seductive eyes mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. So for too long, we as the church, the church universal, have followed in the footsteps of our disobedient spiritual ancestors. For too long, we have compromised our Christian values for the politically correct morals of this world. For too long, we have set in, set in captivity by the willow trees asking the question, how can we sing the Lord's songs under these devilish conditions? For too long, we have gone to church, but we have not allowed the church to go with us. For too long, we have sold our souls to politicians and civic leaders hoping to get the crumbs from the table. For too long, we have allowed our children to be devoured by the hip hop culture, by the money changers, by the drugs and alcohol, by th the thug life and the agenda of the antichrist. Oh yes, we invite Christ in on Sunday mornings and sometimes we even invite him in on Wednesday nights. But the rest of the week, we walk according to the dictates of the world. We see God as being involved and concerned about only this portion of our lives, only a small portion of our lives. We place him in a box over here and the world and its system in a box over here. 
We fail to take him to work with us, to school with us, to the polls with us, shopping with us, to the theater with us, to dinner with us, and everywhere we go, we fail to take God with us. Hence, we and the world lack balance. We lack morals and we lack values because there is a missing piece of the puzzle, and that is the influence of the church. The influence of the church, the body of Christ, the people of God is missing from the world. But in this season, God is calling us to arise and shine. He's calling his church, his saints, to get up and shine, rise and shine, to come out from among them and to be separate, recognizing that we are the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. He is calling the church to be the pace setters, to be the role models, to be the example. He's calling the church to really be his body, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his eyes, to be his mouth, to be his ears. He's calling the church, not an institution, not a religious entity, not a building, not a social tradition, not even just a group of people that come together for fellowship. He's calling us individually, the church, to come out from among them and to rise and shine. But he's calling forth a people who would take up the mantle, grab the baton that was passed from Jesus to the leaders of the first century church, and turn this world upside down. He's calling us. It's a call to action. But too often, as God's people, we tend to sit back and we wait for things to happen. We are reactionary rather than taking action. Once the laws and the policies have already been put in place, it's hard to move them forward. There is an old proverb that's saying, it's easy to pull the wagon up the hill than to push it from the rear. And I believe that's what we tend to do often. We let things happen and then we try to change them. We try to institute what we know is wrong after they've already put their laws in place. We don't realize that we were put here to make things happen. We, God's people, were put here to make things happen. We weren't put here just to sit back and wait until things happen. We were put here to make things happen. So as God's people, we have authority, we have creativity, we have power, and uh, we have boldness to go forth and do what God intends for us to do in the earth. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, when God made man and woman in his likeness and in his image, he told them to be fruitful and to multiply. And he repeated that when he told Noah after the flood to be fruitful and to multiply. He said to Abraham in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. That is what he's telling them, what he told them and what he's telling us today is to produce after your own kind and to do it in great numbers. That is, produce after our own kind and do it in great numbers. We wait for people outside of the church to initiate activities, change, and reforms that have great impact on our lives. We fail to realize that when those outside of us determine our lifestyle, determine our societal norms, determine our economic status and our political views, the parenting practices that have become our God, we etch the almighty God out. We need to be called back to the light. And that's what Isaiah is telling us, is telling the church, the body of Christ to do now. You know, we have been um, quarantined for almost three months. We've been in our homes, and some of us have had an opportunity to get out to do other things. Some of us have gone to our jobs. But for the most part, we have been in exile. And in that exile, in this period, God was looking for us to do some things differently. And we did do some things differently. His messages went out online. The messages, his messages went out on conference call. We use YouTube. We use Zoom. We use all of the tools that the enemy thought that were his to get the word of God out. And so his message reminds us of who we are. He's reminding us that we have to arise and shine for our light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Isaiah here is telling us that we have been called out of darkness and into the Lord's marvelous light. We have been set apart to, be, and to belong to the Lord, to live as his people. 
We have an identity and a purpose in life, and he is prompting us to see ourselves in that way. He's prompting us to see ourselves and the special calling that we have on our lives. So let's look at the words of our text. The word to arise means to stand up, not just to stand up on your feet as in the physical sense, but to stand up for or even against something. You stand against something as an antagonist against that thing, and that thing stands against what you stand for. The word is used in Matthew 24, 7, where Jesus said, nation against nation shall rise against one another. It, is, it expresses the sense of being at war. In this case, we are standing for the light. In scripture, light refers to truth. <clears throat> but there is an antagonism here, and the antagonism is the kingdom of darkness is at war with the kingdom of light. The powers of Satan are launching a campaign of destruction against God's people. And Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief, meaning Satan, comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. He has left his people here that we may have life and have it more abundantly. There are people walking around, they're alive on the outside, but inside they feel dead. They're empty, they've been abused, confused, rejected, alone, and they are hopeless. But God is saying to us, he's saying to the church, you have the message of hope, you have the message of peace, you have the message of love. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. There are those among us who are either too weak, oh yes, or yet or even unlearned. There are those among us who are either too weak or yet unlearned in the practice of spiritual warfare. They have not yet been taught the rudimentary, rudimentary words of Scripture. They have been oppressed, suppressed, and depressed by Satan. They have not learned that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. They have not realized that they are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. They have yet to reach the point where they can see with spiritual eyes, where they can hear with spiritual ears and speak with the tongue of the learned. Therefore, we who have been in Christ for a while, we who have been taught, those of us who have been in Christ and have learned the rudimentary principles have, and who have some level of spiritual acumen must arise to their offense, defense. We must arise to stand in the gap for them. We must arise to the defense of the gospel. We must stand for right and righteousness. And when we have done all that we can, we must stand even the more. We even must arise to the realization that there is some darkness in us that must be fought off. <clears throat> you may not be the wolf in, in sheep's clothing, but you may be still struggling with some unforgiveness, darkness. Slowfulness and laziness seem to camp out at your house, darkness. Still laughing at those crude and vulgar jokes, darkness. Haven't learned how to treat your spouse and your children, darkness. Cheated on your tax returns, darkness. Lying, cursing, jealousy, envious, hateful, and self-centered, all darkness. And Paul says, not as if I have already attained, but we must press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, our growth and our maturity, our perfecting will only come when we respond to the call of action. That is our corporate perfecting, our corporate growth, our corporate maturity will only take place when we, the more uh, learned, the more, the, the more mature, the elders and the leaders will resound and respond to the call of action with a resounding yes and dress ourselves with the whole armor of God. It's not a meek, timid, okay, well, I guess so, that God is looking for. No, he's looking for a forceful, a bold, I won't give up, I won't give in, I won't back down type of yes. So arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. 
Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before the birth of Christ, but he's talking about Christ ultimately. It has already been established that Isaiah is saying this to the God's people, of, to Israel in the Old Testament. He's also saying it to the New Testament church today. That is, he's speaking to us. God's word to you and God's word to me this evening is just this. Arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So you say, what does this mean? I believe we all have a concept of what the word shine means. But when I think of it, we think, I think of a brilliance, I think of a sparkle, I think of a brightness. We may even think of shining the light into a dark place to illuminate it so that we may find our way. Or we may consider the brilliance and the radiance of that diamond that some of you are wearing on your third, your third finger, left hand. But here's my illustration of, of how to shine. On Saturday nights, I often will watch Bishop as he gets ready for Sunday morning and he's getting his outfit ready for Sunday morning. One of his habits in this process is to shine his shoes. I watch as he smears the polish on his shoes and he smears it evenly and then he takes a rag and he applies pressure to the dull layer of the polish with this rag by going over it over and over again until the shoe has a shine on it. Sometimes he may use a brush, but more often than not, he uses a rag to polish that shoe until a shine comes upon it. A sheen and a brilliance and a brightness comes over that, that which was once dull leather, and along with the polish and the rubbing back and forth, the shoe takes on another more appealing look. It's the same shoe, but it's no longer dull, but it's now shining and it's more appealing. The polish was not the sheen, but it was the substance that was used to produce the sheen. The polish was the substance that was used to produce the shine. And that's the way I believe it is with us. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is poured out on us and he is in our heart. But there is an anointing that's smeared on us, that's rubbed on us, so that the light of God can be seen by those who are in darkness. We are to be bright by reflection of a light, to gleam, <clears throat> to gleam, to be glossy, and to shine, as that light that is in us gives us the power to do so. Shine in a sense that it is used in this text refers to reflecting the light from another source. And so we reflect the light of another source. We reflect the light of the God who lives with us, who lives within us, who is indeed the Holy Spirit. As we reflect the light of Christ the, the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we arise out of our slumber, it is not us that the world needs to see, but it is the Christ in us. And John 9, 5, Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, but once I depart, we became, once he departed, we became the lights of the world and the children of light, not the children of darkness. Your light, your light will never shine if you hide it under a bushel. Your night light will never shine as under a bushel of fear, a bushel of low esteem, a bushel of traditionalism, the bushel of bad theology, and the bushel of confusion. Your light will never shine if because of lack of use, it has become like a dull flicker. You can't let your light shine if you are sleeping with the enemy. You can't let your light shine if you are dependent on your job for your substance rather than dependent on Jehovah Jireh, your provider. You can't let your life shine if you are concerned more about what people think about you than what God is doing in you. You can't let your light shine while you're trying to hang out with the in crowd. Your light will never shine as long as you are concerned about being politically correct, correct rather than being biblically correct. Your light will never shine if your image is more important to you than the image of God that is in you. In the biblical sense, <coughs> light <coughs> has at least two meanings. Its first meaning 
is knowledge is in Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Some refer to this as enlightenment, but it simply means knowing. It simply means understanding. It simply means having an intellect, wisdom, and skill. <clears throat> Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He awakeneth morning by morning, he awakened my ear to hear as the learned. Light also refers to goodness and righteousness. It is also just um, metaphorical for life. In John's writings, we see light being used in the revelation of God's love in Jesus Christ and the penetration of that love into the lives darkened by sin. Jesus then is the incarnate word of Jesus then is the incarnate word of God who has come as the light that enlightens that enlightens all people so that those who believe on him will no longer be in darkness. Why is this important? Why is it important that our light has come? Because otherwise we would be sitting in the dark. We would be living in darkness. We would be children of the dark. Isaiah says so in verse 2, for behold, darkness shall come, should cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. This is indeed a prophetic word for us today. This is talking about spiritual darkness, not about the fact that we have limited daylight during the fall and the winter months. Spiritual darkness is being in the dark about God and about ourselves and what life is really all about. And that is the natural condition of mankind since sin into the world. And it's not the condition that we can take advantage of now that God has sent Jesus to die for our sins. We can come out of this darkness and enter into the light of Jesus Christ. But so many of us are just groping around in the darkness, not knowing where they come from or where they're going or what is right or what is the right path to take. Even if we know the right way to go, sometimes we keep wandering off of that path and getting lost. We keep being pulled off of that path by the world's conditions. We keep pulling, getting pulled off of the path that God has set for us by the wickedness of the world, by the things that draw our attention to the world, by the lust of the flesh, by the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that describes, my sisters and the brothers, that that describes the spiritual darkness that shrouds sinful mankind even today. Look at how lost and clueless so many people are. Millions of people around the world, the Muslims with their false god called Allah, post-Christian Europe, which has become completely secularized and is suffering the consequences thereof, the Mormons who have been bamboozled by the false teachings of Joseph Smith, the people who followed false teachers, atheists and agnostics and postmodernists who have no interest in what they disparagingly called organized religion. They fail to realize that we're not calling you to a religion, we're really calling you to a relationship. Even our family members are amongst those who are walking in darkness. We sit among them Sunday after Sunday, Thanksgiving and Christmas and every holiday, every wedding, every funeral, but we fail to let our light shine so that they may come out of darkness. They all have been lost. They all have lost their way. They all are fumbling around in the dark. So much spiritual darkness to go around. But they are not the only ones. Before we get too proud and to get too haughty, let's take a look at our own darkness. Israel of old was suffering the consequences of their own dalliance with darkness. They thought they knew better than what the prophets were preaching. They became like all the other nations around them, thinking they could go in, go, go it on their own without listening to God's word. So as a result, they were driven out of the land and taken into exile. The depressing darkness of the Babylonian captivity fell upon the people and they suffered from their own foolishness. We do that too. Even as God's people, even as the church, even as the body of Christ, we fall into the old ways, into the ways of the world. We tune out God's word. 
warning us against wrong turns and dead ends. We listen to the siren songs of the world, luring us to steer in that direction rather than to go in the direction that God has called us to be. And we end up crashing on the rocks. We indulge our flesh and our desires even when we know it's wrong. And that, my sisters and my brothers, is indeed dancing in the darkness. And that's stepping out of the light and turning back to where we should not go. And we have all done it at one time or another. But thank God for Jesus who forgives us and who reigns us in. Thank God for his grace and his mercy that he doesn't allow us to stay in darkness. Thank God for the fact that he loves us so much that he's using those things. He allows the enemy to pull us off so that he can teach us which way we should not go and we will want to go in the way that we should go. And so the scripture also says, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This may sound like a cop-out, but I believe that there are certain things about God and certain terms used to either describe or explain him that are beyond my comprehension. I don't say that they can be known. I simply say that I don't know them. And that is just how it is. God can be known, but we will never fully know him. Some of you may know him better than I know him, but when we put our stuff together, we know what he's calling us to do. And his glory is one of those things that we search out and that there are many definitions of, many ways to describe it. But when I try to define God's glory, I use the simplest definition that I know of, and here it is. God's glory is who he is. It is his awesome goodness and his righteous character embodied in Jesus Christ, full of grace and full of truth. Let me repeat that. God's glory is simply who he is. It is his awesome goodness and his righteous character embodied in Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. His glory is composed of all of those things that are part of God's way of doing things, part of who he is, part of his character. But remarkably, these godly attributes may and should, by means of the Holy Ghost, be transferred to us, unifying us with the Father and the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. And therein lies our hope of eternal glory. Strong says it, Strong says that God's glory is his weightiness, that which is substantial or heavy, his glory, his honor, his splendor, his power, his wealth, his authority, his magnificence, his fame, his dignity, his riches, and his excellence. In other words, the glory of God is not just a feeling, nor is it an event or an experience. Rather, I say it is a spiritual tsunami of everything contained in the character of God. It has been called the manifested presence of God, but more than just the presence, it is power. It is the kind of power that resurrects. It is the power, the type of power that delivers. It is the power that overcomes and it is the power that transforms. It is greater and stronger than any other power in existence. And my sisters and my brothers, it belongs to us. It belongs to you. The glory of the Lord, which has risen upon us, belongs to you. It belongs to me. It belongs to the church today. It should be operational in our lives. The character, the honor, the splendor, the power of God's glory should be operational in us as we go about our daily business of interacting with those who we walk among. Psalm 19, one says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showed forth his handiwork. John says that we beheld his glory as in the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in John 11:40, at the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would only believe, you would see the glory of God. The qualification for receiving the glory or seeing the glory is simply that we believe and we will indeed 
see the glory of God in our lives, amongst our peers, in the world, in the earth, on our jobs, in our homes, in our churches even, we would see the glory of God if we would only believe. I don't know about you, but I hear the call to action and I intend to respond favorably to that call. If that is your declaration, I dare you to arise and shine and let the glory of the Lord rise upon you. I dare you to stand right now where you are or even where you're sitting to make the declaration that God's glory is going to shine upon me. His light is going to shine through me. I am indeed the light of the world. And because I am light in this darkness, I can dispel the darkness. I will do my part to make sure that the light is shining in the darkness that has covered this world, this earth, our country, our communities, where the spirit of murder is running rampant. The spirit of lying has taken on the face of uh, the person who is in the highest seat of office in our country. The spirit of um, drug abuse and drug and alcohol use is covering and taking over our children, our family members, and our friends. The spirit of the Antichrist is permeating the earth. There are many Antichrists, and it is permeating the earth this day. But there is beauty. There is the spirit of God. There is the glory of God who's also at work in our lives today. And that spirit, which is in us, is more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that spirit is the one who will survive and who will, in fact, be will overcome the spirit of darkness. I thank you for listening. I pray that you have been blessed by hearing that you have the ability to arise and shine and let your glory, let the glory of the Lord shine upon you as you go about your business during these last and evil days.